Thank you. It's time for Tycoons of Small Biz, spotlighting the true backbone of the American economy, the true tycoons of business in America, the owners, founders, and CEOs of small businesses. The show's hosts, Austin Peterson and Landon Mance, are registered representatives of Lincoln Financial Advisors Corporation, a broker-dealer, member SIPC, and registered investment advisor. The views expressed by your hosts, Austin and Landon, are not necessarily the views of Lincoln Financial Advisors. <clears throat> Let's lean in as Austin and Landon connect with this week's Tycoons. Good afternoon, Tycoons, and welcome to today's episode of Tycoons of Small Biz. I'm Austin Peterson, and I'm joined, as almost always, by my co-host Landon Mance from Las Vegas. And then we have our guest today, uh, Eric Walker with Next Step Agency. Ne Eric, thanks for being here. Thank you for having me, excited. Yeah, we're excited to have you here and uh, we're happy to have a few minutes to get to know you a little bit before the show. And one of the things that I neglected to mention to you is that we always try to have our guests tell a little bit about themselves personally. Uh, you did mention that you were married, so kind of just give us a little bit of background on yourself personally where you grew up, maybe where, what you did for, you know, for school, college, and uh, kind of what led you to where you are today. Yeah, sure. Um, grew up in Cheyenne, Wyoming. Uh, maybe some of your listeners have made the journey for a big rodeo. It's the home of the big daddy of them all. So that's kind of the focal point of our town. But outside of that, it's a great place to grow up. And I really enjoyed my time there. Looked at a couple different places to, to go to school and ended up settling on Arizona State University where I did business and communication. And at that time, I think we're talking, you know, I'll age myself here, but 98, 99, um, you know, this economy was booming. And so there were a lot of job opportunities and made Arizona my home. And I've been here ever since, lived in a couple different places, Tempe, Gilbert, Scottsdale, and now I live in Fountain Hills. And yep, with my wife, we've been living here for about two years now and don't have any plans of leaving, but I could really use some cooler weather. So I don't know if you can do anything about that, but. Yeah, well, the only thing that I do for cooler weather is to get in my RV and head up the hill right past your house and up into uh, Payson and Christopher Creek. So that's how I escape it. And I, I read in your bio that you like to hike. And, and that's one of my mine and my wife's favorite uh, pastimes is to get out there and hike, enjoy nature, mountain bike, those sorts of things. So we're, we're in a great place for it. But man, there's uh, a few months during the year where it's pretty uncomfortable to do that down here in the valley for sure. Yeah, we were headed up this weekend to that very same area and we got stopped. I think it was mile post 213, had to reroute back. So we ended up going to Tortilla Flat and a little bit down that way, which um, didn't get us as far into the cool weather as we would have liked, but it was definitely an interesting trip. Well, if it makes you feel any better, uh, I did go up uh, for Labor Day weekend and it was just myself and a neighbor of mine. We took our mountain bikes up and thought we'd enjoy some some time away and and as you i'm sure are aware with the fire a lot of the barriers the posts burned and so the barriers were down and so they had one lane closed because they're trying to repair the barriers and so it took us a really long time to get up there um we get to pace in at about 11 maybe 10 45 make the turn to go towards christopher creek and we get about a half a mile in and traffic stops again it turns out that there was a rollover accident. And so my friend and I spent the evening in my RV, luckily, I mean, the car would have been worse, but we spent the, we spent the whole night parked at the Circle K parking lot in Payson. So hopefully that makes you feel better about having to turn. Yeah, it's amazing. Sometimes that happens and you know, it's, it's one of those things we got to deal with. I don't know about the Circle K parking lot experience, but yeah, I definitely <laughs> can relate to that, that frustration. Yeah, I'll tell you. So, all right, well, great. So Next Step Agency, what, what do you guys do exactly? Tell us a little bit about Next Step and what you guys do day to day. You know, we're a, we're a trusted consulting partner for organizations that want to improve, enhance, or grow. So what that basically means is we try, we try to provide resources that, that help companies have more of the secret sauce. I guess in, in layman's terms, it's the competitive advantage. Um, and we do that primarily through enhancing people 
uh, developing process or bringing technology. Uh, and, and we're a certified Microsoft partner, partnership with Amazon. And so, um, you know, our clients look to us as kind of a subject matter expert when it comes to how do we kind of turn the dial on performance. Oh, very cool. Is there a particular industry or doesn't really matter because it's about the people process and technology regardless of what it is that they do? Yeah, we, we do find that we tend to leverage more of the relationships maybe with government entities because they have a much clearer defined uh, scope of work, if you will. Um, I think we've worked with retail, uh, whether it's big box uh, or, or whether it's uh, small startups, but oftentimes they're a lot more agile. And so, you know, with our process focus, we like very consistent and, and repetitive things that we can see improvements over measurable time. Gotcha. Yeah, Phoenix, I mean, you may work outside of Phoenix as well, but as you know, Phoenix is is really kind of a mecca for small businesses, small mm -hmm. medium-sized businesses. Uh, I think there's actually only two Fortune 500 companies that have offices here in the Valley, right? And so, but it's a very large population. There's a lot of businesses here, but it's mainly small and medium-sized businesses. And so is that, I mean, I'm sure you work with all different sizes of of companies, but is that an advantage for you to have so many small and medium sized businesses here that could use your services? You know, it's interesting you say that. I think that we are starting to see a lot of opportunity open up with everything that's been happening in say the last six to, to eight months. Organizations that we're really focused on, we have big headquarter locations where everybody has to go, have started to say, well, maybe we're not so focused on where you work. It's more about the quality. And so yes, to your point, we, we see a lot of opportunities in Arizona because it's a big hub. There's a lot, you know, there's big universities here, there's investment happening. And so whether you're a small business or a big business, there is a lot of opportunity in the Phoenix market right now. Yeah, it's, it's a great place. I mean, I moved here six years ago and I, I knew it was a larger population. I'd moved here from Utah before that Southern California. And for us, it was, we don't want to go back to California, but we don't want to stay in Utah. And so we looked for somewhere kind of in between. My parents live in Utah. My wife's parents live in Southern California. And Arizona was kind of the logical choice. I was very worried about the heat, to be honest with you. I <laughs> wasn't sure this is somewhere where I could uh, call home. But for me, it's been phenomenal. I mean, we, Landon and I work with small businesses. That's where, that's our bread and butter as well. And so it's been, a, it's been a great fit for us. And, and I don't know that I could see myself living anywhere else at this point, just because it's such a great place for business. It's a great place for the outdoors. It's a great place to raise a family. You know, it, it's, uh, it really is a nice place to build a, an entrepreneurial type business like you have and like Landon and I have. Yeah, I agree. I think we, we talked a lot about, you know, expansion and, and where we would see ourselves in three to five years. And, and to your point, the more we really look at where the opportunity is and, and where the communities are that want to help build and be a part of, Arizona seems to continually be at the top of our list. You know, we're close to California. We have a major airport. There's great support from government and, and local leaders. And, and you know, it's, it's, it's a diverse population of people. And so, again, we just continually come back to do we want to go to Boston? Do we want to sit in traffic an hour and a half each way to work? You know, and, and so this is just some, a place that I think there's so much opportunity for small business owners. Yeah, agreed. And, we, and I mean, we know this, people are moving here nonstop from the Midwest and the East coast just, and it's one of the fastest growing cities in America for a reason, but it's also a great entrepreneurial city period. So it, I, I think it's a great place to be, to, to build a business. What do you think Landon? Yes. Speaking of building businesses, Eric, it's kind of my, it's kind of my MO to, to circle back on, on questions that we should have asked uh, earlier in the interview. So that, that being said, um, tell us, I want to hear about your story on how you started the next step agency. Tell us, tell us that, that backstory, how you got to that point and, and fill us in there if you would. Well, it's a fascinating story, um, and I like to kind of share it because it does highlight some key points of, of what our company believes and our philosophy and how, how we try to consult with our clients. I, in an earlier career, I was a senior sales executive with ADP, um, which you know we focused on providing tax services, payroll services, benefit services to small business owners. And you know, I grew a pretty 
successful, you know, book of business. And as I was meeting with my clients, there was one client in particular that would always talk to me about, you know, growth opportunities, but he would never purchase anything. And he would always say, I see the value in what you offer, but it's just not a good time. And over, over the years, I, I decided to leave ADP, but I went back to the clients, particularly him. And I said, all right, you know, let's put our cards on the table. What, what was it that held you, for, held you back from buying more services and products from me? And he just basically said, look, you know, I love what you offer, but the problem is there's other underlying infrastructure. There's other underlying cultural issues in my organization that prevent me from implementing some of the things that you offer. And so going back to how did I start the Next Step Agency, I realized in that conversation that part of the opportunity is understanding what are the, the holistic view for a business? What are the challenges that they face? And being able to address all of those areas, not just saying I have one product or service. And I know it's kind of counterproductive to what a lot of people might say in business, which is get really good on a, a niche and focus in that area. Um, the next step is really about what is the next step for a company to, to move, move the needle in performance. And so that's really where the next step started. Very cool. You said something earlier that I, I wanted to um, just kind of have you expound upon for, for a minute. Uh, you said something about um, that you, you kind of uh, gravitate a little bit more towards larger companies. I think you, you even mentioned government uh, agencies. And you said because, um, you said because uh, they, they're a little bit more process oriented and then you said also not quite as, as agile. And so what, what came to mind as you said that was that a lot of small business owners, as you probably know, they really struggle with, with consistent, repeatable processes, right? Because as entrepreneurs, we see the shiny objects, we see these opportunities, we see this, we see that, and we veer off course really easily. So my, my question is, how do, you, how do you integrate that thought process and methodology that you use with your larger businesses? How do you translate that over to the smaller size businesses so that you can help them to have a, a good, repeatable, consistent process, but also give them a little bit of flexibility to be agile? No, that's a really good question. And, and it's interesting because you know, there's, there's two sides of the coin, right? There's the things that you have to do to get to where you want to be. And as all small businesses, business owners probably understand, you know, it's a, it's a delicate balancing act of, you know, I've got to, to your point, chase the bright, shiny object because that's what my customers need or that's what the market is asking of me. But then I also have to have structure and I also have to have some systems in place so I can deliver on a consistent basis. And so, we try to do our best to make sure that we're addressing what people need right now, but then set them up for success in the future. And I think one of the things that our consultants bring to the table, you know, they've kind of been around the block a few times. And so they've seen, you know, what it means to be process focused and work in a big organization, have a lot of structure, but then they also know what it means for my clients to say, how do we just get you to step one? Right. And the importance is, as an executive can say, well, step one needs to be done quickly and we can't really spend a lot of time looking back. And so we try to make sure that if we make step one, it's the right step that will set you up for success in the future. Don't always get it right, but it's trying to have a little bit of a blend of the short game, but also the long game. Yeah, I think that's a hard thing to do for entrepreneurs, right? I mean, I, <clears throat> you know, you talk about their they're agile, which can be an advantage, right? Being agile as an organization can be an advantage sometimes if, if you need to pivot to something else and do it quickly, right? Um, but a lot of entrepreneurs tend to pivot too quickly, right? You know, we had Brenda Schmidt with Coplex on a few months ago, and, you know, she talked about how entrepreneurs have to constantly be asking themselves if they should persevere, pivot, or perish, right? Mm -hmm. And... I think that a lot of times you don't see entrepreneurs or small businesses persevere long enough down a certain path, right? They, they get nervous. It's not going as quickly as they thought. It's not going as well as they thought. Oh my gosh, I must be going down the wrong path and they'll pivot to something new 
when if they had waited it out, put the proper processes in place like you're talking about, then they, they would eventually get to that success that they're looking for. Yeah, I think that's interesting because they, they do talk a lot about there are companies that were just about to cross that threshold, right? The, the ink was just about to be put on paper, but to your point, they decided, well, let's go with the, the, this group over here. Let's try this different strategy. And so, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a challenge, right? Because we, we face that in our day-to-day -day where there are opportunities that are presented. And you know, as a business owner, I have to look at the revenue to keep the lights on, right? The profit to keep you know, everything moving forward, but then also staying true to our brand and our customers and really what we think adds value. So it's, it's not easy. And, and I've read a lot of books about it, as I'm sure you have and your listeners as well. But, um, you know, it, it takes that fortitude, somewhat of that stomach <laughs> to be able to, you know, make those decisions. Yeah. And I think sometimes, you know, like we talked about, businesses are persevering and doing certain things for a long period of time but nobody knows who they are or what, th what they did, right? And then all of a sudden they're viewed as an overnight success, right? We see that in entertainment as well. People think, you know, oh, so-and-so was an overnight success. I never heard of them before, but they actually had been working at it for 20 something years, right? Uh -huh. And I mean, we see it time and time again, there's, there's actually a company yet or over the weekend that was sold, it's called Immunomedics. It was sold to Gilead Sciences over the weekend for um, $21 billion. Well, they've been trying to, to put together these different cancer treatments and other drugs for 21 years and had not really been profitable at it or found something really great for the entire 21 years. And then all of a sudden, they had a, a drug that's actually shown to be very, very good from a breast cancer treatment standpoint, and they think that it'll actually be good in, in other you know, uh, areas of cancer as well. The share price on Friday was $42.25. They sold over the weekend at an $88 per share valuation. Wow. And I mean, I actually had a, a client that ended up having quite a few shares and just held on to it, kind of almost forgot about it. And it had grown to $42 over the last 12 months down from, I think it was all as far down as like $12 a share, got up to 42, which was already really great. And then over the weekend sold for $88 a share. And so it, it turned into a, a mega win for that client, mm -hmm. but it's because he held on to it for the last decade. I mean, he's literally held that stock for, for 10 years and not seen a whole lot of movement. Now all of a sudden it's turned into a major windfall for him. And then obviously for the owners of this company. And so, you know, sometimes we just, we just quit too soon. And I think that's a good lesson for, for entrepreneurs to, to realize that, you know, you've got to be solid in your strategy, but don't give up too soon on that strategy if it truly is a solid strategy. Yeah, I would agree. And I think, you know, the saying I think is success is really that, that blend of a lot of hard work and a lot of patience and a little bit of luck, right? And you kind of articulated that, right? It's, it's, they had been at it for 20 plus years and then there was just a little bit of luck and, and it's a game changer. Uh, Mark Zuckerberg is kind of a similar story. I mean, he was hard at work well before he started working on his college-based website. You know, he learned how to code. He learned programming. He was understanding how social networks could potentially work. And then he had some luck, right? It picked up a little traction. People started engaging. And, and I think he, he would probably even admit that it was not what he was anticipating, the growth and the trajectory. I saw an interview that he did it's on YouTube, but I don't know, 15 years ago. And there was another, com uh, another company on the MSNBC segment. The other company was talking about a very similar platform, right? Almost identical. And it's just fascinating because I, the other company, I'm not really sure where they are today, but I'm pretty confident they're not Facebook. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And that's the thing is maybe if they had persevered or they did something a little bit differently, then they could have been the Facebook, right? And right. you might be thinking of, you know, talking about MySpace, you might be talking about somebody else. I, I don't know. But, you know, it, it's funny how these social media things, even new companies have tried to come and replicate what Facebook did. And if there's, if there are legs, then Zuckerberg just says, you know what, we're going to buy them, <laughs> right? And then there are others that start, go for a while and then fizzle out. And so, there is a lot to be said with having the right strategy and staying focused on what that strategy is. And then that little bit of luck, right? 
Yeah, I'm really interested when we talk about strategy right now. I think the hot topic in tech is really this merger or this, I guess they're calling it a trusted tech partner deal between ByteDance and TikTok and, and potentially Oracle if, if it's approved. And, yeah. you know, I, I, I'm, I'm really grasping at straws to come up with a, a strategy here other than maybe web hosting for Oracle, which, you know, competing with Microsoft in the cloud, it, it makes sense. But, um, you know, again, it's just an interesting strategy long term. I, I don't really know even TikTok's strategy at this point. Yeah. Well, I, 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 <laughs> I think I feel more comfortable with Oracle having a, a strategic decision there versus Walmart, which was you know, <laughs> the idea a couple of weeks ago. That one just didn't make any sense at all. But um, may, maybe there was something they know that I don't know, but it just did not seem like the right fit, of course. There's a lot that they know that you don't know, sir. <laughs> All right, let's put that out there. <laughs> Wait a minute. Isn't, isn't their company headquarters in Little Rock, Arkansas? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm sure they are. There is a lot of smart executives at Walmart. So please, if anybody's listening, I, I, I have nothing against Walmart. Um, all right. So Eric, I want to go back to, you know, what you were talking about with this, this customer that kind of changed the way that, uh, that you viewed consulting, right? And you kind of had this conversation about, you know, let's put the cards on the table and what, you know, what did we do wrong? And I think that that gets missed an awful lot uh, in as entrepreneurs, as salespeople, whoever, you know, whoever it is inside the organization is that they tend to lead with a product or a solution, right? And, and now the big difference that in consulting is you're really getting in there and you're saying, let's look at your company as a whole and understand how you operate, what, you, what you're doing, what you're bringing to the table, and then what can I add to that to make you better? And you're not thinking about a specific product. You're just saying, how can I help problem solve? Is that fair to say that, that that's your approach? Completely, completely. And I think that, you know, that, that method oftentimes does not lead to a, I guess I'll call it a sale, right? I think it, it, it's building a relationship and, and putting a foundation of trust in place because, you know, a good salesperson would tell you, you know, your, your sale usually doesn't happen on the first call, right? So um, as a consultant, really, when you become a trusted advisor and a trusted partner, as I'm sure you can relate to in, in finance, that that's when people call, right? That's when people say, hey, I do have a question. But when you're just pushing a product or a service, I think, it's a very transactional relationship and that's, that's not really the model that consulting is built on. Yeah, absolutely. Well, so tell us about uh, equity and why listeners should care what you're, what you're doing with data in terms of equity and, and what that's all about. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, you know, I think it's all the cool stuff in business in, in my opinion is happening at that intersection of technology and business. Um, you know, 10, 15 years ago, I think, when we would talk about technology or IT in particular, it was really viewed as a cost center, right? It was something that we had to do to keep the lights on, to make sure that we had access to the internet. And we're seeing that shift where technology now can drive profit. And one of the key components of that is how we understand data and how we leverage data to make better decisions. And so what we're looking at with equity is the strategic planning process for an organization right? Connecting the dots between I'm a consultant and strategy, right? So the idea is how do we incorporate machine learning and leverage that to help streamline the typical strategic process that I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with, which is, hey, we have a whiteboard and we have a breakout session and we feel really good about what we're doing, but we really don't have measurable KPIs. We don't really have a clear vision or a mission. And oftentimes that momentum is gone after you leave that maybe half day or full day event. And so equity is, is taking machine learning and saying, based on this cloud of information about your business and other businesses, how do we really hone in on some data that helps you make really good decisions and saves you time and cost throughout that process? Interesting, interesting. So help us kind of dive, dive a little bit deeper here, if you will. Um, so. I know that you've got some interesting thoughts around kind of the, the size of the problem between, you know, uh, the kind of the missing link between data and strategy. So talk to us a little bit about that, if you would. Yeah, no, that's, that's fascinating, right? I'm sure a lot of the listeners are familiar with Moneyball, right? Which is kind of that science of how did they incorporate data and sports? And we've seen it with 
Golden State, right? Golden State looked at what are the best shots to take? What are the best players and what are the best matchups? They even looked at scenarios in, in games where they said, if the score is this and it's this quarter, here's the approach we should take. And obviously we've seen the results in a very short period of time, numbers, numerous championships, right? And from a team that for all intents and purposes, I don't think people even knew was in the NBA. And so we're really trying to look at how do we use data and how do we use um, you know, information to make educated decisions as quickly as possible. And so one of the areas that gets missed, I think, is strategic planning. You know, most people go into strategic planning thinking, we know where we want to be in five years, so let's just throw some ideas on paper on how to get there. And I'm like, we have a wealth of data from other companies, from past performance. Let's incorporate that into the planning process and maybe start with that and then see where we go. Yeah, interesting. So my wheels are spinning. So let's let's continue down 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 this path. I hope path that's a good thing. I... <laughs> yeah, no, no, absolutely. I think it's I think it's you know, as I as I as my wheels turn, it's all about trying to think about what our our listeners and our our clients and people that are listening to this and following this will find valuable. And so I think that uh, if you could kind of give us an example of um, obviously the strategic planning process can have a lot of different avenues that you go down depending on the organization, their goals, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, for most of our listeners and our, the people listening, you know, to this show and our clients, they're smaller size, you know, businesses, you know, 50 million in revenue and, and, and lower. So maybe you can give us an example or two of something that you talk about through the strategic planning process that would be more relevant to some smaller size businesses, just so we can kind of wrap our heads around, you know, some things that you talk about in that process. So, and I'll answer it in two, two ways. First, I'll give kind of, a, of an analogy of big data because I think that gets thrown around a lot and maybe it helps to have some foundational understanding of what that means. And really, when we talk about big data and we talk about analytics, we're really just saying that right now we have the ability to assess a lot of data very quickly. And so our, our brains do that, right? We, we, we go to a new scenario and we look at a lot of different data points to make decisions. And so, you know, with big data, it's saying, how do we leverage technology to do that for us in our day-to-day -day operations? And so then the second part of that is, well, what would be a scenario where a business owner might be able to leverage big data? Mergers and acquisitions is a perfect example. I think a lot of organizations are in a position where they might be thinking about, we either want to acquire a business, maybe we want to create a teaming agreement or a merger, and there's a lot of numbers that have to be crunched. And the traditional model is to really do sharpen your pencils, Excel workbooks, a lot of different models, whether it's discounted cash flow or, or all these different financial models that get used. But from a strategic perspective, assuming that you're going to do these things, what is the expected outcome based on data? What have we seen happen with companies similar to yours that go down that path? And so it's not saying don't use the financial models, but it's saying if we look at companies that operate in your space that do the same type of merger you're evaluating, where did they go in three or five years? And did they accomplish the goals that you're hoping to achieve? Yeah. Interesting. That's very relevant to Austin and I, you know, just selfishly, that's, that's very relevant to our practice together because we, you know, we advise a lot of business owner clients around succession and, and exit planning. Yeah. I mean, that, that's obviously a big focus for us, but uh, for me, I find it even more fascinating to think about the fact that, you know, you're, you can use that data and what I think of, you, you said Moneyball, right? Mm -hmm. And for those who aren't familiar with that, I mean, it's a movie about the Oakland A's and Billy Bean and this process that they, that they went through to build a team with a really low payroll and they still have a low payroll. And what I glean from this from a business standpoint is, gosh, you know what? The same thing can be true here because you spend or lose a lot less money if you have more data input to begin with and you're making smarter decisions from the get-go rather than potentially making a wrong decision and losing money along the way. So 
you're ultimately saving businesses money by having more data and making more data driven decisions along the way. Totally. And, and I think that is how you build a competitive advantage. Yeah, agreed. Well, I think this is a great spot to stop to hear a, a word from our sponsor and then we come back and we've got some more questions for you if you'll stick with us. Whether you're an established local company or a brand new startup, you can count on GBS to be part of your family. We're not just any benefits consulting firm, we're GBS. We have nearly 30 years of experience in group benefits, a strong sense of purpose, and it shows. GBS, believe in something better. GBSbenefits.com. All right, tycoons, welcome back. We're here with Eric Walker with the Next Step Agency. And Eric, you're frozen on my screen, so hopefully you can still hear me and are with us. Are you there? I think oh, we lost him. Looks like we lost him. So Landon, what can you tell me about uh, Eric's book? No, I'm kidding. Eric's coming <laughs> back on. Let's, <laughs> let's just give him a second to reconnect. Yeah, he's, yeah it looks like he's... he's, he's Getting logged back in here in just a second. Eric, I think you're muted if you can hear us. We're still here, tycoons. We're just waiting for Eric to get uh, logged back in. Bear with us here. Eric, you there? I am here. Okay. <laughs> you guys, you can see and hear me. Okay. Well, we can hear you. We can't see you just yet, but that's that's okay. At least we can we can hear you. So before the break, obviously we were talking about uh, data and strategy and the missing link there and, and really what we can do with the power of data. But let's, let's shift gears a little bit and, and have you tell us a little bit about your book. Sure, so Seven Simple Strategies. It's a journey of leadership. We really try to use illustrative stories. Uh, I'm a storyteller by nature, so making things visual and easy to implement for a reader was key. Um, you know, there's a lot of really serious leadership books on the shelf, right? And um, I wanted to create something that was easy to read. So this is something that you can pick it up, easily read through a quick chapter, maybe pick up a couple key pieces of, of wisdom. And uh, every time you read it, you might pick something else out that resonates with you. But, you know, it should be something that leaders can relate to um, as they're working to, to enhance their, their ability to, to help teams and help guide uh, other people in the organization. Go ahead, Lance. Yeah, yeah, interesting, Eric. Um, so, a lot of the, you know, a couple of the characters in your book, um, you know, they they have some rather profound realizations that that come to the surface. So, is that are are those inspired by you know real life or those you know fictional or what's going on there? Yeah, the the characters are really based on somewhat of a parable approach, right? So there's a lesson in each of the stories. I think if you, you know, you read these, you would find that a lot of those stories connect because I think they're very relatable in the sense that, you know, it's, it's a story that we can kind of visualize ourselves being in that scenario. So an example would be, you know, a, a CEO wants to give the business or, or, or has, his son has worked there, but he's ready to kind of pass the torch to his son. But he says, okay, well, before I hand you the business, you have to pass the, the, the handing over quiz, right? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to send you out there and come back with all the knowledge that you gain. So go down to the factory floor, listen to what you hear and, and be observant, and then let me know what you see. So the son goes and does this task and comes back and explains what he heard and what he saw. And then the father says, unfortunately, you fail, but you can try again. So the son, a little bit dismayed, goes back for a second opportunity. This time he takes really good notes and prepares an excellent PowerPoint presentation and he still fails, right? So now he's pretty dejected and he's thinking he's never gonna be able to step into his father's footsteps. So he goes back and just kind of sitting there with his head in his hands and somebody comes over and says, hey, what's going on? And kind of explains the situation. And the guy says, well, look, here's what's going on in my life. A car broke down on the way to work today. 
my son's going to college, I can barely afford it. The machines aren't working. Every time we try to ship a new project, a new product, it, it breaks down. And that's when the light bulb went on for the son to say, you know, I need to understand my people. I need to understand their challenges and, and look at the organization uh, from, from the level of people before I, before I can step in and just, you know, operationally lead the company. And so that's something that can, re, you know, a lot of people I think can relate to in a, in a leadership position that it's important to understand what's going on with our people as well as our business. Yeah, absolutely. I want to circle back to that, to that point you just made, because uh, I was listening to a, a virtual summit, uh, kind of a virtual conference, if you will, earlier this morning, and we were talking about human capital. So I, I want to circle back to that in just a second. But uh, if you would share with us, you know, what, what was your motivation behind writing this book? Well, I, I like to set goals. Um, and so I think the first one was, can I actually put my thoughts in a coherent manner and, and publish a book? So that was kind of my own personal goal. You know, I love to read. I love being inspired by people. And I wanted to share some of that in the world. And then second, it was, you know, a lot of the leadership books have, have very, uh, you know, strict guidelines and processes. And, you know, Seven Habits could be an example. I, I think it's a great book, but it's a very structured approach. And a lot of the lessons I've gotten in my own personal life have just been from conversations like today. And I think that's, that's a great way to approach it. So I wanted to put that step storytelling approach to leadership in, in a book. Yeah, I've got uh, um, some pretty aspirational uh, book writing goals myself. I'm going to have Austin ghost write a book for me and I'm going to stick my name on it. That's so uh, that's my plan. And that's, that's just really because, cool. yeah. how to keep your hair well into your, your old age. Is that what it's saying? <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I, mean, I, I may be able to ghost write that, but I certainly can't speak from experience. But uh, yeah, Landon wants me to write it because we all know that that Long Beach Unified School District has uh, failed <laughs> him in his, writing, in his writing abilities. Correct. Correct. So a couple, a couple of things actually that sparked for me. So you mentioned, you know, seven habits of highly effective people as era. Uh, yeah. Seven habits uh, by Stephen Covey. So I got, I got a quick story to share about Stephen Covey. So um, when my son was in fifth grade, I coached his, I coached the offense on his football team with Stephen Covey's son, Sean. Uh, and Sean was a college quarterback as well at BYU. And so, you know, we had a good time doing that, but we had our, our end of year party at Stephen Covey's house and he's got an indoor pool uh, at his house. And well, he's passed away now, but he did at the time. And it happened to be on a Saturday when the University of Utah was playing Notre Dame in, in football at in South Bend. And uh, there's a big, there's a really large screen, like probably, I don't know, 80 or 90 inch television out in the pool house, but it wasn't working. And so Steve Covey comes out and grabs a sl slice of pizza and he's talking to us for a little bit. And he says, you know, I've got the game on inside if you guys want to come in. And I'm thinking we're walking into his living room. No, he leads us into the master bedroom. <laughs> and we're, we're sitting at the foot of Stephen Covey's bed watching the University of Utah play Notre Dame in football. So pretty, pretty interesting and funny story. I thought it was a little uncomfortable being in Stephen Covey's uh, bedroom, but <laughs> was his uh, bed made at least? <laughs> yeah, the bed was made. The bed That's was. That's the made. first step, I think, is, is yeah. to make your make your bed. So yeah, his was probably made by a maid. Let's be honest, <laughs> but, uh, it, it was made. Um, but the the second thing that it made me think of is that story in your book. It it reminds me of of one of my clients actually, and and somebody that was on the program. Um, gosh, a few months ago. Um, and it's a father that started a business and then son came to work for that dad in the business, but he started at the very bottom. He started as a technician in the business and kind of worked his way up. And now he's the CEO of the organization and he's taken it from where it was to where it is today, which was a pretty big leap forward in the last few years. And a big portion of that is the fact that he went all the way through the business, learned the people, learned the processes, People respect him more that work for them now and they will do anything that he wants them to do because 
he didn't just show up as dad's son and take over. He, he worked his way through the business and learned it himself. So pretty, pretty cool story that goes right along with your book there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there are a lot of stories where similar to what you just described. And I think I've seen where people can sometimes go off and, you know, they go to school, they get a job, they work in the industry, perhaps like maybe not at the, the parent's company or the father's company, but they work in the industry and then they come back later. And, and I think that's important. I think, you know, we're seeing a lot of shifting going on in, in large organizations right now, you know, CEOs making moves and, and doing different things. And, you know, I, I understand the, the approach and I understand why that happens. But I think, you know, in, in my backyard and, and the companies that I'm working with, I think it's, it's important to understand the value and, and the business proposition that you've got. And so working in an organization, I think I'd highly encourage companies to, to take that approach. Yeah, absolutely. Sorry, Lynn. Looks like you were going to say something. Yeah, I want. I wanted just to circle back real quick um, to uh, what I had mentioned, Eric. You know, I think that as as a lot of small businesses start to understand the impact of of uh, you know of COVID on their business, and they're and they're hopefully you know starting to to rebound and to to see light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, I think that a lot of people are realizing that it's not their product, it's not their process, it's not anything other than their people that are going to help them to get out of, of this mess that, you know, a lot of us are in. So can you talk to us a little bit about, you know, like, what define, you know, human capital and, and kind of help us understand what that is and why that's, you know, relevant, especially, you know, during these times to small businesses. Well, you know, one thing that I firmly believe, and, and I think it's been resonating a lot more to your point recently, is that family, community, friends are really more important than wealth and success. You know, I can always replace wealth, uh, but I think, I'm learning that I have to do more, I have to be more, I have to engage more. Um, I have to spend a lot of time investing in myself, but then also invest in others. And so, you know, to your point, human capital, you know, it's the people aspect of the business. And we're, we're gonna see some challenges, I think, as we go forward. It's, it's amplified through COVID, I think, because of the ability to work remote. You know, it, it's hard to say, but if companies had their way, they would automate everything, right? Because humans make mistakes, right? Humans learn things slower. Um, and so as a business owner, we have to embrace that. And we have to understand that, you know, there's a bigger picture than just profits. And that I think investing in, in people, investing in the community, investing in relationships, you know, the, the rising tide lifts all boats, right? And so that's why human capital is so crucial to a business community, uh, to, to our communities and to the country as a whole, right? We have to be supportive. And so I love automation, I love technology, but I would never say that it doesn't start first with people, then process, then technology. Yeah, well said, well said. Um, what, maybe you have a suggestion or, or uh, an idea or two that you could share with us around, you know, um, Due to the, the new, well, let's just say that the current, you know, work environment for a lot of companies, which is having their employees work remotely, what's something a company can look at doing to help to, you know, for lack of a better word, you know, lift, lift their human capital right now, you know, being that, uh, you know, a lot of us are working remotely. Yeah, there's a couple great things that I've seen work well. Um, the first is, you know, communication is key. And I think, you know, I've, I've talked to a couple of clients that were doing a really good outreach campaign where the executives or at least the senior leadership team was reaching out and just tapping, you know, touching employees through an email, through a phone call, you know, often ways that maybe we don't have time or we overlook, but it means so much to an employee to hear from somebody to say, you're valuable to the organization. And I know that we're remote. Maybe we can't say hi in the hallway like we used to, but we really appreciate what you're doing. And so that outreach piece uh, through an email or, or even a letter, you know, postable, something like that is, is good. Um, 
you know, I've also seen companies investing in technology. So fortunately my Zoom wasn't working, but when you can use the video conference, right? When, when you can have maybe a Slack set up for your organization, which is an instant messaging platform, because it keeps people engaged, right? It's, it's a lot easier to communicate and, and feel invested when you're seeing other people post comments and, and, and share funny memes and, and, and you know, have that opportunity to express themselves. So I think those are two things that you know, companies can do very, very easily and, and not, not a lot of expense. Yeah, it really is about uh, staying in touch. And I, I would actually say that the same thing is true of, of clients, right? Is you got to make sure that you're reaching out to those clients, even if they've been a client for years, um, you, we should be reaching out to them and having a greater degree of communication now than we've ever had in the past, just so they realize how much we appreciate them and, and how important they are to us. And, and that's going to pay back. That's going to pay dividends, uh, in a large way in terms of, you know, making sure that your business remains relevant during all this. So Eric, um, we're going to kind of come full circle here with leadership and entrepreneurship. And so I'm going to ask you the uh, dreaded question that every entrepreneur wants to, uh, or doesn't really want to answer, but what do you know today that you didn't know three years ago? <laughs> um, well, I would say, you know, I've, I've kind of relearned, the saying that everyone has a plan until they get punched in the face, courtesy Mike Dyson. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think we've all been a bit punched in the face over the last year, uh, but you know, he went on to become a, a world champion several times over. And so in boxing, you've got to keep moving forward. It's important that you, you keep your chin up. And so that's kind of, you know, I would say the biggest lesson right now is biggest lesson again is that it's important that we keep moving forward and, and keep our chin up right because we'll all accomplish accomplish our championships in our own way but we can't we can't stop moving right we can't stop and feel down and, and kind of lick our wounds we've just got to keep going forward and then second you know again it's it's that family community it's the friends it's re i guess learning that you know wealth can come and go um, and it can be measured in different ways, but I think I can always replace that. I think now it's, I need to be involved more. I need to engage more and just make sure that I am investing in those people around me because, you know, now more than ever, we, we need community. Yeah, absolutely. So on, on the flip side of, of that, um, give us some insight into, you know, um, next step what, what what's the next step for the next step agency what, what do you what do you got planned you know the next uh, couple of years for the company so we've we've kind of changed a lot based on what's been going on but we have a couple of different products we're working on um, you know obviously we, we like to move into a model that's more scalable so I think equity as a platform a software as a service helps us make that move a reality um, because we can touch more customers. We're not restricted to geography. Um, you know, we could do business with people in other countries. Um, and so I think it helps enable our team and our consultants to be more effective for our clients. So that's one thing is moving into the software as a service uh, space. Um, another thing that we're looking at is, you know, really trying to partner with, with people like Amazon, with people like Microsoft, because a lot of our clients use those systems and that's not gonna go away or change anytime soon. So the more training I can get from my team, the more training I can expose myself to, the more we'll be able to help our customers along their journey. Um, and then third, I think is investment. We're you know, currently talking to different sources of funding. You know, we've looked at SBA, we've, we're talking to some, some banks and I think you know, it's, it's almost like the fuel for a fire. So if we can, you know, have some access to capital, I think we can fast forward some of our, our expansion plans. And so those are kind of the three areas that we're focused on in the short term. Okay, very cool, very cool. Well, Eric, um, it's been really, really enjoyable talking to you. I, I think we've got a lot of great little nuggets to, to take away. And um, Austin, unless you have any other, you know, questions or anything you wanna ask him about, Eric, um, Talk to us for a minute here and tell us, you know, how do we, how do we find you? How do we track you down? What's the best and easiest way to, to connect with you and your team? Uh, you can reach us on Twitter or Instagram. It's at the next step 
HQ, um, or you can reach, check us out on our website, www.thenextstep.agency. Um, I'm also on LinkedIn. I love connecting on LinkedIn, so feel free to shoot me a message. That's how we connected. Um, I think it's a great place to, to build some of that community. So I'd love to hear from any of your listeners, and you know, let's, let's make some awesome things happen in Arizona. Yeah, we appreciate it. We, we, we really have appreciated the conversation. We look forward to watching the next step over the years to come and, and what you guys uh, turn this organization into. And we appreciate you being willing to come on the show and have this conversation with us. And there've been some great insights that you provided to us and, and to our listeners. And we'll look forward to obviously seeing those posts about it and we'll post about it as well and get the message out there. So thank you very much, Eric. I'm so appreciative of your time and allowing me to come on the show today. It means the world to me, um, you know, knowing that there's a community that supports business owners like myself. I really appreciate what you're doing and thank you so much for this opportunity. Yeah, the you're feeling welcome. is mutual, Eric. Thank you, man. You've been listening to Tycoons of Small Biz, proudly hosted by Austin Peterson and Landon Mance. Austin and Landon are comprehensive financial planning professionals specializing in financial, estate, and succession planning for small business owners. Austin and Landon have offices in Scottsdale, Arizona, and Las Vegas, Nevada, and represent clients in 14 states throughout the country. Join Austin, Landon, and the Featured Tycoons live every Tuesday at 1 p.m. right here on Business Radio X and your favorite podcast platform. All right, we're clear. Are you still with us, Eric? I am still here. Um, the irony of a technology company having technology challenges <laughs> is not lost on me right now. Right, it yeah. happens. <laughs> I'm going to shut off the video recording here and make sure.